This is historian explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. My list of patrons has been steadily growing these past few months, and so now I have another installment of the history of the United States in 100 objects. This one will be initially for patrons only. And it's the sixth installment in the series on a bronze cannon with a fleur-de-lis emblem. So this particular cannon was made in France, most likely in the 1540s. It was lost in a shipwreck somewhere between about 1562 and 65, and is presently located on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, not far from Cape Canaveral, Florida. So this is very different from any of the other objects I've discussed before. It's not in any museum collection. It hasn't even been excavated and clearly examined or photographed, except from observations by divers. And as I said, it's located on the floor of the ocean. Its exact coordinates are not known to the public. And the reason is because of its value and because of its disputed uh, ownership, which I'll talk about later. So how was this cannon found? Well, in 2015, a salvage company called Global Marine Exploration, based in Tampa, was searching the seafloor around Cape Canaveral, mainly looking for rocket parts and debris, which can often be found near the, uh, the launch site. Instead, they ended up finding a series of clustered 16th century shipwrecks with various large objects that could be discerned in the debris, including 22 cannons, namely 19 iron cannons, and three larger bronze cannons, as well as several large ships' anchors, and a single tall marble pillar with an emblem uh, carved into its side. So the 19 iron cannons are probably ships' guns that came off of the vessels themselves that sank, whereas the three larger bronze cannon are more likely fortress cannons that were intended to be installed around a fortified town or castle. And one of them, as I said, has a clear discernible fleur-de-lis emblem in, uh, embossed into the side, indicating almost beyond a doubt it's French in origin. In addition, the marble pillar that I mentioned has the French royal coat of arms with three fleur-de-lis and a crown carved into the side near the top of the pillar. So it seems almost surely that these unusual artifacts found around these shipwrecks must be connected to the early failed attempts at colonization of North America by France. So Although Americans don't often know this, the earliest colonies on the North American mainland, north of the Valley of Mexico, those earliest European colonies were actually French, not Spanish, and specifically they were created and manned mainly by Huguenots, right? so French Reformed Protestants, who were a uh, persecuted and embattled religious minority in France. So that much seems to be clear that these objects found near Cape Canaveral are connected to that very early colonial history. But how exactly did they get there? And what are these ships that went down? Well, that is much more complicated and subject to dispute. Although, as I'll tell you at the end, there has been at least a legal conclusion to this question of what are these ships and where did these objects exactly come from and how did they get to the ocean floor. One hypothesis about these, uh, these objects is that they may have sunk with two lost ships that went down on the way to the French outpost of Fort Caroline on the St. John's River in Florida, or that they come from a small fleet 
that actually sank as it was leaving, uh, trying to escape from Fort Caroline in 1565. However, global marine exploration has argued that those ships reportedly went down farther north, closer to the site of Fort Caroline, which is more or less at the location of today's Jacksonville, not down near Cape Canaveral. And they argue that the pillar and cannons are the ones that were actually installed at this French Fort Caroline and were uh, then later taken away. So they have argued that these objects can't actually be from the two French ships that went down or the later fleet that sank by that sank in 1565, but rather that they come from a the Spanish fleet that destroyed Fort Caroline and that must have confiscated these objects and were carrying them away, but then later sank on their way southward towards Cuba. Okay, so these are two competing basic uh, theories about how these objects ended up where they are. Were, were they on French ships that sank as they were coming or going to the French outpost, or were they later uh, raided and confiscated by the Spanish? And this turns out to be very legally significant. But before we worry about that uh, latter-day story, we have to look at the bigger context of what was happening in Florida and in wider North America in the mid-1500s. Well, early on in the 1500s, the Spanish claimed Florida, and what they considered, what they called by this name Florida, was not just the peninsula or the area that's now the state of Florida, but all of continental North America that they knew of. So they laid claim to all of this based on the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, which gave Spain uh, sovereignty over anything that they could find, explore, or conquer, uh, basically on the western side of the Atlantic. However, they didn't colonize. There were occasional landings and short-lived expeditions, beginning with Ponce de Leon, in the southern and western coasts of modern-day Florida. And there was, of course, Hernando de Soto's Entrada, which I discussed last time when in the installment about the set of chevron patterned glass beads. Uh, but none of those landings or expeditions led to any kind of permanent lasting settlement, not even a permanent uh, Jesuit mission. So the French saw an opportunity in this situation, the possible chance to exploit extensive foreign resources, to establish their own overseas trading empire in these largely temperate lands that uh, the Spanish were not effectively defending, and also, at the same time, a chance to get rid of some of their unwanted population within the kingdom particularly Protestants. Right? So Protestantism spread rapidly in France, especially southern and southwestern France, from the 1530s onward. Uh, and it was particularly popular and caught on among sort of town-dwelling middle classes, people they called bourgeois. Uh, but it also gradually reached upward into the French gentry, the upper class, and even the aristocracy. Possibly the most significant early convert to the Protestant faith in France was a very respected, accomplished, and high-born admiral named Gaspard de Coligny. So Coligny came from a major aristocratic family. He was a courtier and close personal friend of the king, and he was uh, a fairly accomplished naval admiral. He was converted by his brother, and he started corresponding directly with John Calvin himself, the great reformer and theologian at Geneva, starting in 1558. So that's the earliest that we know for sure that he was a committed Protestant. Coligny, it seems, started hatching plans 
to move fellow French Protestants out to colonies abroad. And this, as I said, would kill two birds with one stone. It would further the power and prosperity of France, to which Coligny was very committed, and it also might provide a safe haven and a sort of outlet for Protestants. He gathered money and political support and helped to found a colony called France Antarctique, or Antarctic France, basically at the site of what's now Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in 1555, right? So he may or may not have been uh, a Protestant even yet at that point, but his brother was, and he was already helping with these ventures. And France Antarctique lasted for 12 years before it was uh, destroyed and the people were expelled by the Portuguese and their indigenous allies. Nonetheless, Coligny moved on to other attempts to colonize uh, unclaimed or unoccupied lands in North America, closer to Europe. And he sent the Norman army captain Jean Ribot, a fellow Protestant or Huguenot, uh, he sent him as a leader on these colonizing ventures. Okay, so what eventually happened that relates to these canons and pillar? And where did they come from? Well, in 1562, Ribot sailed to Florida and landed near the mouth of the St. John's River, basically in the area that's now Jacksonville. And when there, he and his lieutenants erected a marble column, a sort of multi-sided, probably octagonal marble pillar with emblems of the French crown on it uh, near the mouth of the river. And this, uh, this was a, in keeping with a common French custom, right, which was to erect monuments, more often crosses, but sometimes pillars, together in collaboration with native peoples. Uh, and when these, uh, these sort of towering objects were erected, it would uh, serve several purposes. It would mark the French presence and lay a sort of initial claim to French suzerainty. And also it dramatized, in a sense, the indigenous people's acceptance of French uh, leadership and Christianity. Now, probably in most cases, the indigenous people who took part in these ceremonies didn't entirely understand what the French took them to signify. Uh, but that didn't stop the French from doing it. Later on, French and Dutch reports say that this particular pillar erected by the St. John's River in Florida remained standing for several years afterwards. So however the indigenous people there understood it, apparently they uh, maintained it uh, and did not see fit to tear it down. And I'll get back to that later. At this point in the early months of 1562, Ribot did not proceed to create a colony in Florida, at least not in this southern area that we now call Florida. Rather, he proceeded further up the coast to basically to what's now Port Royal Sound in South Carolina. And once there, he did set down small fortifications and created an outpost that they called Charles Fort, after King Charles of France. It consisted of a small uh, fortress, storehouses, and a few small barracks or dwelling houses. Ribot left there 27 men and put his lieutenant Albert de la Pierria in charge. Ribot then sailed back to France in order to obtain more supplies and promised to return back to Charles Fort as soon as he was able. However, when he landed back in France in the later months of 1562, he found that civil wars had broken out, religious wars in France between Catholics and Protestants. Basically, Ribot had no choice but to be drawn into these civil wars as a uh, military captain himself. So he fought and rendered significant service to the Protestant side but eventually lost ground and was forced to flee the country and went to England 
In England, Ribot gained an audience with Queen Elizabeth and was able to gain some English backers and supporters for these colonial ventures, considering that many uh, English people, including possibly the crown, uh, sympathized with the French Protestants and saw this venture overseas to America as possibly a good development, extending Protestant power into lands that had been claimed by their Catholic arch enemies, the Spanish. In 1563, because uh, Ribot was unable to return to America, but instead uh, he was accused of being a spy and eventually imprisoned in England, another military officer, René Goulin de Laudonnière, uh, took his place. And Admiral Coligny formally appointed him in place of Ribot uh, to continue these colonizing ventures. However, he still couldn't go for several months and needed to gather support. So there was a further delay basically all through 1563. And meanwhile, Charles Fort, back in South Carolina, was left uh, isolated without supplies or reinforcements. The fortress began falling apart, and by the end of the year, the men were starving. They also lived under horrible draconian discipline by Pieria. And it seems that the last straw in this situation was when Pieria exiled one of the men of the company named Lachère to a small island where he was left particularly starving and in danger of dying. So the surviving men mutinied, killed Pierre, and went to the small island and rescued La Cher. However, they saw that Ribot had not returned and probably wasn't coming back soon, so they had no supplies, and hence they dismantled certain parts of Charles Fort, used the parts to build a boat, and all of them embarked together onto the sea, hoping to somehow sail back to Europe on this small boat. And only one uh, young boy chose not to go with them, but instead went and joined the local uh, indigenous Timukua people, which all in all, it seems, was uh, a better move. <laughs> this, is what, this is what smart colonists tended to do early on in the 15 and 1600s. If things weren't going well, as they often weren't, they would simply go and make peace and join the local Indians who actually knew how to survive and thrive in that environment. So this is what this one young man did. While the rest uh, embarked on their makeshift boat and soon found themselves again starving with no clean water. And finally, they drew lots to decide which one of them they would kill and eat so that the others could survive. And guess who drew the lucky lot? Ironically enough, it was La Cher, the guy whom they had already rescued from the island. So they had to eat him, and then they continued drifting back in the direction of Europe until they were finally found by English mariners and taken back to England. And once again, they were given an audience and met the queen. In the meantime, back uh, at Charles Fort, the Spanish uh, were able to investigate and find out about these French colonization attempts, which they considered to be illegal and contrary to their sovereignty. They located Port Royal Sound as the place where this early colony had been set up. They were able to find the one young man named Guillaume Rufi, who had taken refuge with the Tumukwa Indians. Rufi pointed out the site of the fortress, which the Spanish then burned, and from which they confiscated six small iron cannons and a stone pillar. Okay, so so already you might notice this is one possible source where maybe some of these objects discovered from Cape Canaveral might have come from, but we don't know. The French did not give up on colonizing Florida. But rather, the next year in 1564, uh, René Goulin de Laudonnière was able to launch another voyage, which went back to the St. John's River near what's now Jacksonville, as I mentioned before. 
And there, he and his compatriots were able to find Saturiwa, the leader of a friendly Timukua tribe, right? A, a local group who had established friendly relations with the French during their landing two years earlier. And they showed him a sort of small shrine with offerings of food that they had assembled around the stone pillar there uh, on the St. John's. Laudonnière then began to construct a much larger fortress called Fort Caroline, basically, again, near what's now Jacksonville. The fort uh, was larger and more impressive and had uh, more than, probably at this point, more than 100 residents, most of them French Huguenots. However, it was very poor, and they had to depend for food on the Timucua, who, naturally enough, soon began tiring of having to give all of these free supplies over to their French allies. So even that stream of food that they were depending on began to dwindle, and the population of Fort Caroline grew more and more desperate. One group, it seems, split away, seized one of the ships from the French fleet, and sailed southward, resorting to piracy, right, attacking and raiding uh, Spanish ships for money and supplies. By the end of the year, it seems Laudonniere was resolved to give up on Fort Caroline and return to France. But before he could launch a return voyage, Ribot finally showed up again with a larger fleet of ships, supplies, and about 600 colonists. So really enough for a substantial village. He relieved Laudonniere of command and uh, committed himself to making a permanent French colony. And it seems that this colony was able to hang on and survive until the summer of 1565. And this is when it seems the other shoe finally dropped. So a Spanish fleet commanded by Pedro Menendez de Aviles showed up, coming up the Atlantic coast of Florida. So Pedro Menendez de Aviles was an admiral who had commanded the Spanish treasure fleet, the sort of uh, armored, the large armored convoy that traveled each year between uh, Mexico and Spain, carrying taxes and treasure from America back to Spain. And on one of his previous treasure fleet voyages, one of his ships had disappeared, gone missing, and on board that particular ship was Menendez's son. Uh, so he wanted very much to go back and explore the area of Florida and the Caribbean in order to search for his son. And for a long time, he was not allowed to do so. But finally, in 1565, he got the opportunity to do this. When the crown learned about the extent and size of the French fortress in Florida and resolved to completely destroy it and sort of nip these French uh, efforts at conquest and colonization in the bud. So the crown commissioned Menendez to go back with an armed fleet to America and seek out and destroy this French outpost. Now, the Spanish crown and Menendez, too, for that matter, saw these French colonists as doubly guilty. Okay, Not only were they trespassing and settling without permission in Spanish territory, in their view, but further, they were the worst criminals that you could possibly be in two ways at once. Pirates, right? So some of them had engaged in piracy. And under traditional law, pirates were considered hostis humani generis, or enemies of all mankind, who must be basically uh, destroyed and killed wherever they're found. And they were heretics, right? They were uh, traitors against the church and the faith. So for all of these reasons, the Spanish crown had no qualms about simply wiping this colony out and treating them really with none of the normal courtesies of medieval law of war or Christian canon law. So Menendez first landed a good distance, maybe about 40 miles or so below Fort Caroline and created a temporary outpost uh, 
basically at the site of what's now St. Augustine, right? So this is, this is how St. Augustine started, as a kind of makeshift military encampment built on the old site of an Indian village, which was simply a way station on this uh, mission to destroy Fort Caroline. And it was located also near a spring with fresh water, so it could be sustained for longer if necessary. And it seems that St. Augustine Menendez uh, had the first Catholic Mass in North America heard. Okay, so uh, this was understood as, in one part, as a, a religious mission, right, of defending the church against the encroachment of Protestant heretics. A storm followed shortly after, and this prevented the French from simply marching southward and attacking and destroying St. Augustine, which otherwise they might have been able to do, right? The, F the French garrison was larger at this point, and it's possible that they could have simply uh, attacked right away at a moment of Spanish vulnerability, but they were prevented by weather. It seems that weather really worked against the French in this incident. So instead, Menendez was able to uh, strike first and use uh, initiative and the element of surprise, uh, marching overland rather than landing by sea, as the French might have expected. And many of the French colonists, who were largely civilians, including women, uh, fled onto their ships in order to escape uh, the coming attack, the, the outcome of which was very uncertain. Only a small skeleton crew of defending soldiers remained at Fort Caroline. So the Spanish were able to attack uh, quickly by land and overtake the small garrison that remained. And they proceeded to simply kill all of the soldiers. Right? No quarter was given. About 140 uh, were killed. And most of their bodies were then hung in trees with a sign uh, marking the site of the massacre, saying that they were killed, quote, not as Frenchmen, but as Lutherans, which was their word they were using for Protestants. So the leader of the French colony, Jean Ribot, had fled onto one of these ships, and he apparently hoped to maneuver southward and land near St. Augustine in order to attack the smaller Spanish outpost. It seemed to be the natural thing to do, given their strength in numbers. And the Spanish uh, pursued them south. It seems that more storms hit, and Ribot's main flagship, called La Trinité, ran aground near Cape Canaveral, and others reportedly sank farther out uh, from the coast. Menendez then returned to St. Augustine, and on his way back, he found groups of shipwrecked uh, French fleeing uh, onto shore and trying to somehow return to some sort of point of shelter. But they didn't really have anywhere to go, considering that the Spanish and St. Augustine were between them and Fort Caroline, which in the meantime had been captured anyway. So the Spanish found these uh, French survivors, including Jean Ribot himself. The French naturally enough surrendered. There was not much they could do to defend themselves. And Menendez began marching them back northward toward St. Augustine. But as he did so, he split them off into smaller groups of 10 each. And he and his lieutenants would take each of these small groups of 10 question them as to whether or not they were confessing Catholics, and if they said no, simply killed them on the spot. Okay, And it seems over the next few days, other small straggling groups of survivors were found, including another even larger group than the first one, and Menendez and the Spanish gave them the same treatment, basically killing the majority of them immediately if they did not uh, profess to be Catholics. Uh, only small numbers survived, either by uh, professing to be Catholic or because they were underage uh, young boys. And the area on the coast south of St. Augustine, where this uh, these massacres took place, is called Matanzas Bay, 
and that's what the Spanish named it. Matanzas means slaughters or massacres. So in the following months and years, Menendez undertook various further expeditions around the Gulf Coast and Atlantic Coast, explored and set up and supplied small missions, especially Spanish Jesuit missions with small garrisons. Okay, so after this destruction of Fort Caroline, the Spanish really took the idea of colonizing and occupying the coast of what they called Florida more seriously. It was, so it was spurred on first really by these French actions. Okay, so where did these cannons and marble pillar come from? Well, another possibility to consider is that they might be from Fort Caroline and that uh, they might have sunk with Ribot's fleet as they were fleeing southward from the Spanish attack. However, global marine exploration and their representatives argue that those ships were very small, uh, with a small displacement, and the anchors that have been found at these shipwrecks correspond to much larger vessels. And so they argue that uh, it couldn't have been La Trinité or these other uh, small French ships under the command of Ribot. Furthermore, one must ask uh, if this was the fleeing French fleet, why did they take these large, very heavy objects with them, such as the large marble pillar and the three bronze cannons? Uh, wouldn't that just take a lot of time and effort that you wouldn't have if you were trying to save your population from an approaching attack? Hence, it seems possible that maybe uh, those objects were left at Fort Caroline and were later seized by the Spanish. Okay. Another possibility is that they could be from Charles Fort, and they could have been at some point uh, confiscated from that fortress in South Carolina, and that they were on their way to Cuba, the main nearby large Spanish colony, when they sank in some other incident or another storm or hurricane. Uh, and shipwrecks along that coast of Florida are very common, right? Uh, finding one that's this old with objects of this historical importance is very rare, but shipwrecks in general are not. So there conceivably could be an infinite variety of ways that those objects ended up on a vessel that went down near Cape Canaveral. This question ended up being dragged into court in 2016 because the Republic of France laid claim to the wreck. Okay, France has, of course, a close diplomatic relationship with the U.S., and under U.S. maritime law, it is understood that uh, a foreign nation that has diplomatic relations with the U.S. can lay claim to the wreckage of any vessel that go goes down in United States waters. Uh, so France's sovereign claim to these ships, if they were French ships, did not expire when they sank, right? They're still French property, nor apparently did they expire with, say, the French Revolution and the abolition <clears throat> of the crown and the monarchy. So they can still legally claim debris and these artifacts if they were, in fact, French royal vessels. Now, as I said, global marine exploration disputes this based on mainly on the apparent size of these ships. Okay, And this was argued for more than a year and a half in U.S. District Court in Orlando. And finally, in July 2018, this district court uh, ruled in favor of France, concluding that the preponderance of evidence says that the shipwreck is, in fact, La Trinité. Right? So legally, uh, it does not have to be proved one way or another beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, but the preponderance of evidence, in their view, indicates that uh, these ships were, in fact, La Trinité and, uh, and Ribot's fleet, and hence uh, they will be excavated cooperatively by the state of Florida and the Republic of France, and most likely uh, whatever is salvaged will at some point be displayed uh, for 
public benefit. So that is the final disposition of these objects. But uh, as you can see, this incident surrounding Fort Caroline, which probably one way or another led to these shipwrecks, were a rare occasion where the brutality of the religious wars in Europe spilled over into America. Right? This was uh, an unusual incident. And it was really only in this brief period in the mid-1500s that it seemed possible for the French Huguenot Party to undertake these kinds of ventures with the backing and patronage uh, of the crown. Right? So this is part of why these objects are so remarkable and so historically significant. If we go back to Admiral Coligny, who was the man who actually envisioned and spearheaded this project of colonization, uh, he ended up meeting his demise in the sort of disastrous downfall from power of the Huguenot party. So Coligny, despite uh, the failure of this colonization project, he ended up rising and becoming the main leader of the Protestant party and particularly of the Protestant armies in the civil wars that broke out again a few years later and that ended with a favorable peace in 1569. He ended up again becoming a mentor of the king and a close influence over Charles IX, who apparently was a sort of weak and impressionable figure and a target for a lot of palace intrigue and political wrangling between the Catholic and Protestant camps. His main arch enemy was the Guise family, a very wealthy, powerful, uh, committed Catholic aristocratic family that at times also became kind of the de facto ruling dynasty of the kingdom. A few years later in 1572, the king's sister married a major Protestant ruler, King Henry of Navarre. And this dramatic wedding, which seemed as if it might help lead to a reconciliation between the Catholic and Protestant parties, uh, attracted a lot of uh, spectators into Paris, including a lot of very excited and jubilant Protestants who came into Paris to celebrate. However, after the wedding, as some Protestants were sort of marching uh, in a column back to their hosts' homes in Paris, Coligny was shot at from a window, and his finger was shot off. And it seems that the shooter was a servant of the Guise household. So this incident caused great alarm, right? That, that the major leader of the Protestant party had survived uh, a brutal assassination t attempt. And rumors and panics sort of spread through the city that night, including the notion that the Protestants were going to regroup and retaliate against this insult. And eventually a rumor spread that the king had ordered his loyal Catholic subjects to kill all the Protestants in order to, pre to prevent this counterattack. And this sparked a wave of murders and massacres, uh, mostly of Protestants, through the city, which has been called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. <clears throat> Coligny, of course, was the great uh, target, and a gang uh, attacked the house where he was uh, staying in Paris and managed to break through to his bedchamber where a servant of the Guise household eventually confronted him, uh, stabbed him, and helped to throw his body out a window to show the crowds that he was dead. Witnesses mainly say that he was calm and uh, said that he was willing to die for his faith, but one also recorded his last words as being, quote, would that I might at least die at the hands of a soldier and not of a valet, right? So sort of a last little aristocratic insult towards, uh, towards his assassin. And the death of Coligny really in many ways, uh, although the Protestants remained a significant wing in French society, they never really could contend for political power again. 
And thenceforward, French colonization overseas, like in Acadia and Canada, were thoroughly uh, Catholic ventures, right? So in a lot of ways, this, uh, this often forgotten but pivotal moment of Fort Caroline, uh, which really blazed the trail for large-scale European settlement and intervention and eventually conquest of North America, was really unique and was a product of this moment that ended very shortly after and really ended because of the sort of, you know, ruthless, uh, limitless brutality of this religious war that uh, engulfed Europe in the 1500s. So thank you so much for listening. And please rate and review the podcast uh, wherever you listen to it, on whatever platform. And I should have more installments in not too long. Thank you. Thank you.